This is your daily Facts Matter update, and I'm your host, Roman, from the Epic Times. And now, right before we dive into the topic of election integrity, I want to mention that at this moment, I am in Indianapolis, and this evening, I will be going over and speaking with the Truckers Convoy, which is having a rally right down the road. If you want to watch the full coverage live, you can do so over on Epic TV. The link will be right there in the description box below. And if you use promo code ROMAN, you will get a 14-day free trial. So you don't even need to pay anything. Just click on that link, use promo code ROMAN, and you can watch everything that we're doing live without paying a dime. However, I hope that you enjoy the subscription so much that you continue and tell your friends and family. And now, let's move on over and talk about Mark. Zuckerberg. Just yesterday, over in Wisconsin, the special counsel who was appointed to study the 2020 election, he officially submitted his report, and his findings, you can say, quite frankly, are rather troubling. To start with, the special counsel, he found that the millions of dollars that Mark Zuckerberg spent on the Wisconsin election, well, they violated the state's laws in regards to election bribery. Or, to be even more specific, the almost $9 million worth of Mark Zuckerberg's grant funding, which, by the way, went exclusively to five Democratic strongholds within the state of Wisconsin, well, it violated Wisconsin Election Code's prohibition on bribery. Now, before we dive into the details of the report, let me give you a brief background on both the report as well as the Zuckerberg funding. You might remember that in August of last year, in August of 2021, the Speaker of the Wisconsin Assembly, who is a lawmaker by the name of Robin Voss, he authorized the Office of the Special Counsel, which was headed up by a retired state Supreme Court justice named Michael Gableman, to investigate all the concerns regarding election integrity that came out of the 2020 presidential race. And so again, that was in August. Then, three months later, in November of last year, the special counsel, he delivered his initial interim report to the Wisconsin Assembly. And while he was giving his update to the Assembly, he told them that, in his opinion, there, it was clear that some form of cover-up was taking place. Here's specifically what Mr. Gableman, who is again the special counsel in Wisconsin, here's what he told the Wisconsin Assembly back in November of last year. Quote, Green Bay Mayor Eric Ginrich and Madison Mayor Sataya Rhodes Conway have chosen to ignore the subpoenas issued by the Wisconsin Assembly because they have no intention of answering uncomfortable questions about what they did with the millions of dollars in Zuckerberg money that they took. Now, in that statement, as you likely noticed, Mr. Gableman mentioned millions of dollars that came from Mark Zuckerberg. And this requires a bit of context to explain. There was a report that was released by the Thomas More Society. I'll put it up on screen for you. And this report detailed how Mark Zuckerberg donated approximately $400 million in order to quote unquote help out the 2020 election. And the bulk of that money, it went to an organization that's called the Center for Tech and Civic Life, which is a nonprofit which was started by former managers as well as former staff members of another organization that's called the New Organizing Institute, which was a progressive nonprofit. And so what that means in practice is that Mark Zuckerberg donated $400 million to an organization that is both led as well as staffed primarily by Democrat activists in order to quote unquote help out the 2020 election. Now you might be wondering, because it's of course the next logical question, how exactly they were help helping out. Well, according to their official website, here's what the Center for Tech and Civic Life aims to do. Quote, we harness the promise of technology to modernize the American voting experience. What you get? High performing election offices, increased public confidence and trust, a more resilient and adaptive election system, better informed voters. Now, that of course sounds all well and good. However, what did they specifically do in order to achieve that goal in the year 2020? Well, according to this report from the Thomas More Society, what they did was that prior to the 2020 election, the Center for Tech and Civic Life, they began sending out their agents into the Democrat strongholds of different states in order to recruit the local leaders there. Then those local leaders would have would fill out and prepare grant applications, and then those applications can be sent back to the Center for Tech and Civic Life, and then the requested money would be sent right back over to the Democrat strongholds in order to help them get out the vote. And as an example of how this actually worked in practice, well, according to the report from the Thomas More Society, the Center for Tech and Civic Life, they gave $100,000, again, of Zuckerberg money to Mr. Corey Mason, who is the mayor of Racine, Wisconsin, in order to have him go to four other cities in the area. And specifically, those cities were Democrat strongholds. And in those cities, he recruited local leaders, he held them to develop a plan, and then they sent in a request to the Center for Tech and Civic Life in order for them to execute that plan. And indeed, the Zuckerberg money came rolling in. According to the report, in June of 2020, which was five months prior to the actual election, the cities of Milwaukee, Madison, Green Bay, Racine, as well as Kenosha, they submitted their plans. And then subsequently, approximately $9 million were given to them in order for them to implement those plans. Now, again, if you were a generous person, you might look at the situation and you might say, hey, you know what? This sounds like a good thing. 
The Center for Tech and Civic Life is just using Mark Zuckerberg's money in order to help out local election officials. They are subsidizing their work, they're making the elections better, and they're also saving you and me, the American taxpayers, well, they're saving us money. It sounds like a good thing. Which could have been the case in theory, but according to that report by the Thomas More Society, the money flowed overwhelmingly to Democrat strongholds at a ratio of about 10 to 1, meaning that for every $10 that went to a Democrat stronghold, only $1 went to a Republican area. Here's specifically what that earlier report from the Thomas More Society said on this front. Mark Zuckerberg's money allowed these Democrat strongholds to spend roughly $47 per voter compared to only $4 to $7 per voter in traditionally Republican areas of the state. And the question which has been hanging in the air since the year 2020 is whether any of this was actually legal. Because according to the Help America Vote Act, which you can see up on screen right there, it requires that state election plans must be submitted to federal officials for approval, specifically in regards to making sure that all the resources and all the money are available equally to all voters. And so everything that I gave you is the full background on the new report, which just dropped yesterday in Wisconsin, which, as I mentioned earlier, determined that Mark Zuckerberg's election money did in fact violate Wisconsin election laws in respect to bribery. And so what this new report says is that Mark Zuckerberg, as well as his wife Priscilla Chan, they provided financing that allowed the Center for Tech and Civic Life to, quote, offer nearly $9 million in Zuck bucks to Milwaukee, Madison, Racine, Kenosha, and Green Bay counties. In exchange, the Zuckerberg Five, that's what the report calls these five counties, in effect operated Democratic get-out-the-vote efforts. Those grant funds then paid for illegal drop boxes to be placed in Democratic voting strongholds. And in regards to the drop boxes that they just mentioned in that report, well, this was another area of concern that the special counsel highlighted as well. Because according to the Wisconsin state election laws, Wisconsin citizens, by the way, otherwise known as Wisconsinites, they are limited only to casting ballots either in person or by mail, unless they have very, very special circumstances, making ballot drop boxes unconstitutional. In fact, just last month, the state Supreme Court over in Wisconsin, they upheld a ban on these drop boxes for the upcoming April elections. Although, by the way, I'll mention that that particular ban is not permanent, but it is a tacit acknowledgement by the state Supreme Court that those drop boxes are very likely unconstitutional, which is what this new report says as well. However, getting back to the topic of Mark Zuckerberg, as well as his money, well, the report goes on to say that the Zuckerberg Five, which is, again, those five different counties that took his money, they violated, quote, federal and state constitutional guarantees of equal protection. The grant money targeted specific voters for special voting privileges to the disadvantage of similarly situated voters located in other Wisconsin counties. Now, in this regard, the report went on to detail the evidence of how these five counties, they allowed private groups working with the granting organization, which is, of course, the Center for Tech and Civic Life, to, quote, unlawfully administer aspects of the election, including in one county where one organization was unlawfully embedded in local government election administration. Now, by the way, I'll also mention that there were other issues highlighted in the report as well, such as how, for one, the Wisconsin Elections Commission, they issued illegal directives which allowed local officials throughout the entire state to ignore the laws governing voting in nursing homes. We covered, by the way, this issue uh, in greater detail in a previous episode, as well as how non-citizens were allowed to remain on Wisconsin voting rolls despite the fact that it was against the law. And there were other aspects to the report as well. In fact, if you want to read the full thing in its entirety, I'll throw a link to it down in the description box below so you can go through it yourself point by point and see what they actually found. However, it is worth mentioning that the special counsel, Mr. Gableman, he is not looking to overturn the 2020 election, but rather he stressed that he wants to learn from what happened in 2020 so that illegal activities will not occur in the future. Specifically, in presenting the report to the Wisconsin Assembly, the special counsel said that it represents a, quote, small step towards fulfilling the duty of all citizens of our state and our nation to work hard to secure our democracy for this generation and the next. Now, in terms of the next steps in this process, well, now that the report has been presented to the legislature, it contains concrete recommendations that they can implement to address both the problems as well as all the illegalities that we mentioned earlier, such as the Mark Zuckerberg money, the draw boxes, etc. However, in terms of whether the legislature actually has the political will to implement them, well, that is another matter, and we will just have to wait and see. Regardless, though, as I mentioned earlier, if you would like to read the report for yourself in its entirety, that way you can look through all the facts for yourself and make up your own mind, I'll throw it into the description box below this video for you to check out. And all I ask in return is that you take a super quick moment to smash, smash, smash this like button so the YouTube algorithm will be forced, well, to share this video out to countless more people.
And now, let's change gears a little bit and talk about the lawsuit against the Wuhan Institute of Virology. All right, I'd like to quickly mention that today's episode is actually brought to you by American Hartford Gold, who's not only our sponsor, but they're actually my own personal gold and silver bullion dealer. So right now, besides the rate of inflation having gone up over the past year to a 40-year high, What's happening between Russia and Ukraine is not only sending the markets into a free fall, but the price of oil is now skyrocketing up to the moon, which I can imagine will only make inflation worse. Now, I don't give you any financial advice, but to be frank with you, because I've been buying up physical gold and silver for the past five or six years now, I sleep better at night knowing that my savings are protected against not only this turmoil, but also inflation as a whole. And so I would highly recommend that you, if you are interested in buying up physical gold and silver, check out American Heart for Gold. They're an awesome company. They have an A-plus rating with a Better Business Bureau. They're super friendly and the rates are some of the lowest in the market. And best of all, right now they're having a promotion for our viewers, for viewers of Facts Matter. So on qualifying purchases, for every ounce of gold that you buy, they'll throw in a free ounce of silver. So for every ounce of gold, they'll throw in a free ounce of silver. So calling them is a no-brainer. Give them a ring at 866-242-2352. That's 866-242-2352. And they can show you how you can protect your savings and your retirement accounts against inflation by investing in physical gold and silver. Or if you don't want physical gold and silver uh, delivered to your doorstep, they can actually have it deposited into either your IRA or your 401k accounts, and they make the entire process super, super simple. So get, give them a call at 866-242-2352. Tell them Roman sent you, or you can just give them a text. Uh, you can text the word Roman to 65532. That's R-O-M-A-N to 65532. American Heart for Gold, thank you so much for sponsoring this episode. While I was down in Florida just a few days ago, I took the unique opportunity to sit down and speak with Mr. Eric Schmidt, who is the Attorney General of Missouri, and we discussed not only his many challenges to the Biden administration, but also how after a full year of jumping through many, many, many legal hoops, his lawsuit against the Wuhan Institute of Virology has finally been serviced. Take a listen. Yeah, so I'm the Attorney General in the free state of Missouri here, and uh We've really made a hallmark in, in our office of pushing back against overreach, whether it's at the federal level or at the local level. And what we've seen from this administration uh, has been uh, unprecedented overreach, whether it's um, you know on the vaccine mandates that we were the first state to file, suit, go all the way to the Supreme Court and win, or even on border security issues. We, Missouri led the way with Texas to reinstate President Trump's Remain in Mexico policy, which was working at the border. And you see what's happening now, the amount of fentanyl and illegal activity coming across uh, it really is a disaster. So we're leading the way on that. And then also at the local level with mass mandates and things like that. So, you know, I've used my job as the lawyer for six million Missourians to, you know, defend the Constitution and protect people's individual rights. In America, it has been the hallmark of who we are, right? A country that stood up, you know, in 1776 and said, you know what? We believe that everybody should have opportunity. Everybody's endowed with certain rights. Government's only job is to protect those rights. And so when I see that, uh, level of abuse happening at the federal local level, we're not going to hesitate to take action. So b before we dive into some of the specifics, uh, specific lawsuits and back and forth that you've had with the administration, I have a kind of a general question to ask. It's, I mean, it's a, you, you take a general view of, of it and a very naive view and you think, okay, well, you have the executive branch, branch which is supposed to be enforcing the laws, the legislative branch makes the laws, and so in, technically the executive branch is very confined to what they do. Maybe they can set priorities and prioritize what they're going to be focusing on, but technically they're pretty confined to their options, right? But it seems like, at least based on the, the lawsuits that you've been, you've been going back and forth with the administration on, they're, they're very uh, they're either pushing the bounds or going beyond what the Constitution allows. Can you sort of set the stage for the viewers who who might not be like as dialed in, in into the details of it all, what is the thinking behind th that kind of approach? Yeah, I think it's, it's a great question because I think it's an opportunity to take a step back and understand what our founders envisioned with this system of government. They had seen tyranny across the world. They had seen consolidation of power. We were rebelling against a king, which was one person, the divine right of kings, and whatever he said was supposed to go. So what they, they were students of human history and um, students of their time. And what they said was, is we want to have a government where power is you know dispersed and that's what the separation of powers are all about that is what you know checks and balances are all about so that no one branch no one agency no one person would ever get too powerful so that there are always this sort of these factions competing with one another and that what was the purpose of that to protect individual liberty right because when you have a consolidation of power and we've seen some of this happen during covid right consolidation of power it affects people's individual liberty so that was the idea they also had a system of federalism. The states created the federal government, and they agreed unanimously to only certain powers that the federal government would have. So when the federal government goes beyond that, a government of limited powers, it's up to the states to push back and say, you've gone you know, 
you've gone awry here or you're out of your lane now. And so what we're doing is part of this great experiment that's gone on now for, you know, 240 plus years in this country and has been a beacon of hope for people across the world that people can live their lives, pursue happiness without intrusive government interference. And that's what this debate's all about. And all these lawsuits, quite frankly, are all about is what is the power the executive have? Can the executive really force a hundred million people to be have a medical procedure without Congress ever even weighing in on that? Or with the Constitution ever allowing that? The answer to that, of course, is no, but we have to go to court to have these issues, um, you know, ferreted out. Yeah, and, and that's a great segue to the next point, which is that, you know, in Canada, you, of course, had the Freedom Convoy mm -hmm. go across the country, stop in Ottawa, but then they met with heavy backlash, uh, the state of emergency was enacted, and of course, essentially you can say financial warfare has been waged against them even not only the protesters but anyone who supports them is now being targeted financially so you, you saw that and of course you know their trucks are being impounded and even sold now at this moment as we're speaking there's a, tr a trucker convoy heading to dc they, they start in several places on the west coast now they're heading to dc honk uh, honk yeah. hashtag honk honk yeah, exactly right, yeah. right. so i saw so a couple a couple of questions first is let, let's say those truckers are watching you right now what would you tell them uh, keep fighting for your rights. Um, I, you know, we were, I was one of two state AGs that launched an investigation into GoFundMe. After people had donated to this trucker convoy, uh, GoFundMe first decided that they were going to distribute the money however they wanted to, like Black Lives Matter, then pulled back and said, oh, no, we're going to return the money. But that kind of partisan decision-making process for a company that holds itself out as some distributor to a charity you select is a real problem. And so... Thankfully, those truckers stood up to the Canadian government. I think for a long time, people thought Canada and Australia were these, you know, they're nice people there, but the governments were, were fine, and they just had, you know, cuter animals in Australia. But what you're seeing is tyranny take hold, right? And the pathway to tyranny is paid with these emergency executive orders. You have people in Australia who are walking outside in a park without a mask on being arrested. And you saw what was happening in, in Canada. People were speaking their minds. One of the reasons why our lawsuit on the OSHA vaccine mandate was so important is we currently have a supply chain crisis in this country, in the United States. That would have only been exacerbated, particularly in the trucking industry, if these folks would have been required to get a vaccine. I talked to trucking companies and truckers in Missouri that said, you know, half the workforce is just going to walk out and do something else. And so that's what was happening in Canada. So I think that kind of Civil disobedience should be encouraged. I think these draconian financial measures punishing people who were objecting to something is ridiculous, and the prime minister ought to be ashamed of himself. I believe almost a year ago now, where your office filed filed against the Chinese Communist Party yeah. for their cover-up, uh, the punishing of the whistleblowers for the, chi for the, for the virus in Wuhan. Uh, <laughs> but instead, it seems like what happened is that they were awarded the Olympics as a, as a recompense yeah. for what they did. So has that lawsuit made any, any traction? Yeah, it's been, uh, so we were the first state to file, one other state filed the lawsuit, Mississippi. But we, we filed the lawsuit, and here's what we allege, that um, they covered this up, they sat on the information, you know, they knew about the human-to-human -human transmission in November or December, didn't tell the world about it until the end of January. They limited domestic flights, international flights weren't limited, they hoarded, uh, PPE. They went from the largest net exporter of PPE to the largest importer of PPE, dumped their bad PPE on the world. They have a hospital system that lied to the world. So the Chinese Communist Party, which of course runs the People's Republic of China, is directly responsible um, for the proliferation of this virus across the world, you know, killing people and upending the economy. So Missouri was the first state to sue to hold them accountable. Um, we've had to, we've sued uh, the People's Republic of China. That is uh, a process where you have to go through to serve the state through the Hague Convention, which they objected to. It's taken us a while to get service. Um, same on the non-government actors like the Wuhan lab. And so we're getting to a place finally now where we've got service uh, and moving towards, you know, they may be in default, but we're not going to rest. I mean, we want to seize assets. And that is what we're going to do once we get a judgment here. So we're not letting up. It's just taking a while to make its way through the courts when you're when a state like Missouri is suing, you know, the the People's Republic of China, uh, it's not like serving the uh, the florist down the street. You know, it's a different animal. So, so you're saying that uh, we have to wrap up? Now, that was not the full interview. If you'd like to watch the interview in its entirety, you can do so over on Epic TV, which is, of course, our awesome no censorship video platform. 
And besides the rest of that interview, there's a ton of other awesome content on there as well, including movies, documentaries, dozens of great shows. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, starting today, we'll be covering the Truckers Convoy live exclusively over on Epic TV. If you'd like to try it, I'll throw a link into the description box below. As I mentioned earlier, if you use promo code Roman, well, you can get a 14-day free trial and see if you like it. And if you do, I hope you continue your subscription and maybe even tell your friends and family. Again, the link will be right there in the description box below and use promo code Roman to activate your 14-day free trial. And then until next time, I'm your host, Roman from the Epic Times. Stay informed and stay free.